Welcome to the Shoot in the Cube podcast, the podcast that's hotter than your competition cooker and your first wife. We'll be talking barbecue and more with one of the top pitmasters in the game. Get ready for juicy tips, saucy tricks, and sizzling stories that'll leave you hungry for more. Let's start shooting the cube. Here's your host, Heath Riles. How's it going, everybody? Today, we've got a special guest in house. Of course, besides my wife, Candace, we've got Kevin LaRock here today. I know a lot of people pronounce his name wrong, but not me. I get it right. Only when I come here between you and Mitchell. Why you got to throw my name in it? Okay, Mitchell's fault. All right, Mitchell's fault. Everything that happens, even though Mitchell is not here or lives in another state, it's his fault or COVID's fault. That's what we're going to say from now on moving forward. All right. All right, Kevin. So for the people that don't know you, tell us who you are, uh, what's your barbecue team name, and a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name's Kevin LaRock. Um, my team is Kevlar Barbecue, and I brought, got that from Kevin LaRock, but K-E-V-L-A-R. A lot of people don't know that. They're, a lot of people don't know that they – they make jokes that's too tough. You know, what is your meat tough? No. So like Kevlar. So Kevlar. So awesome. So where are you from? Uh from Michigan. Clarkston, Michigan. You grew up with Kid Rock. He lives in the same town. You and him ever hang out? Uh not personally. Man, you could have told a good lie right then. <laughs> I mean something. He does hang out at a local restaurant. And he gets his own section all uh, blocked off. And when he goes by me, he calls me big guy. But he doesn't talk to anybody else. So. Oh, it kind of makes you feel special. Yeah. I know what it is. Me and, sometimes me and him text, and he's like, yeah, I seen big guy again. Such a liar. I know. Well, look, everybody, you know, Kevin, me and him have such a good relationship. I went and I taught a barbecue class in Michigan. What year was that? 2017. 2017 i was cooking hot and heavy then and rolling around and and traveling the country and i got asked to come teach a barbecue class and i you know i didn't want to drive all the way to michigan and it was in december and i was like oh i've always heard horror stories about michigan in december so through was it mitchell that we kind of got connected or somebody who was it for maybe richard parker that was through the great lakes barbecue association at the time That's so right. I'm not sure who you talked to, but that's that was one of their. Well, you were cooking. You had some Traegers, like you still do now. Yep. And were you cooking on a Deep South then, maybe? No, never had a Deep South. Never I had, had a Southern Q, but Southern I wasn't Q. on the Southern Q then. Okay. Yeah, it was the Traegers you had. You yep. said you could bring some Traegers to the class for me, <clears throat> and I ended up shipping my meat to you yep. for the class. And then we ended up hitting ho- hitting it off as buddies and you ended up staying in the hotel room with me in the extra bed I had so you wouldn't have to go back and forth. Well you had to tell that story, didn't you? Well I mean man, you give great back rubs. I mean (laughs) I didn't want to say that. But no, I I mean, you know, we just become great friends is what I'm trying to say. I'll never forget it. It was a memorable trip with all the snow we had and everything else trying to do that class outside. Uh, it was probably four foot of snow. Yep. I mean it was uh that was a really cool experience for myself, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Well I met you before that. Was I drinking? We it was the first time I met you was uh, Murfreesboro. That's right. You were across from uh, Mark Lambert, and you guys were there. Sort of talked to you, but we didn't we didn't meet. And then I took your class in January in Lakeland, Florida. That's right. At Whiskey Bent Barbecue. That's right. And that's where we became associated with each that's other. Right. We were we were acquaintances there. That's right. You come down with a couple of other – it was four of y'all that come down. Y'all rented a house, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. It was, uh, Nicole and Chad and uh, Mike. Yeah, that's right. And we did. We, we You took my class, and then I wound up coming to Michigan to teach a class. Yep. That was earlier that year, yes. Yep. And I had signed up for that class, and I called you. I said, hey, if you need anything, let me know. I'm only two hours away. Mm-hmm. And Mike said, hey, can I get my meat sent there? That'll – you know, that'll save me a lot because I'm going to get on a plane. I said, sure. I said, anything else you want? And you said, okay. Called me back in like five, ten minutes. You said, hey, I just refunded your money. Help me teach a class. Yeah. So. Been rolling ever since, right? And since then, I've been winning, too. 
Well, I mean, I'm not going to – it's because of you cooking. It ain't got nothing to do with me. I don't cook with you. Uh, I mean, you've got to cook it yourself. You you taught me. It ain't like you you don't earn it, let me say that. You're out. And so tell us a little bit about your accolades and, and awards you've won or, you know, anything like that. Um, we're at – we've had three grand champions um, and three RGCs. So that's that's the best of our accolades that we've gotten besides going to the Jack – our first time draw for the Jack, we were we were drawn, and seventy four or seventy six teams, and we ended up taking second in chicken, and tenth overall. So it was it was an awesome Jack experience for that, us. That's a that's a great trip to the Jack. The yep. First time I ever went, we we wound up with a second place one eighty brisket and a second place one eighty sauce, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, it's nothing like cooking in that hollow down there in the middle of October. Oh, it was awesome. We were just, I think me and Matt were going to go like head to head because I was messing up the, the chicken and we ended up winning or second place. So well, he apologized. You can't beat that. Now, you've also won team of the year a few times in the Great Lakes Marpacy Society, right? Yes. We've gotten uh, team of the year overall. Um, Last year for Division Two, because we split it up and got Division One, Division Two, and I can't run with the big dogs and do you know fifteen comps a year. So uh, we won Team of the Year overall. We won brisket and ribs this year. Last year we won brisket, and we tied the year before with uh, Rich Parker and Tom Summers, and Tom had a an extra point for getting a one eighty. That was the tiebreaker, so he won that one. Well, you've been really consistent then, right? On brisket. I think in 19, 18 or 19, I got team of the year in brisket, too. So are you basically still cooking that same brisket recipe? Exactly. That I was cooking from before. The only thing I've changed is using uh, A9s. That is it. the butcher shop. Wow. <clears throat> I can honestly say I know two other people cooking that recipe, and they're probably cooking 25 comps or better a year, and they're both sitting pretty heavy. Um, it's a consistent you, recipe, I'll say that. It's what you taught the first the first class we took in 2017. So. Wow. That, and you have went to cooking on an outlaw now. Yes. And that's, mean, that's made a big difference. That's that Cadillac. That's made a big difference. J. Craig makes a, an amazing, amazing, I call it a machine. It, I mean, pretty much is. You know, it, it, it runs itself. and It does. You just got to feed it a, a stick or so of wood. Ever, ever. Well, it, it doesn't run itself. Matt runs it, you know, my, my teammate. <laughs> well, so, hold up. Maybe we need to get Matt here <clears throat> for Memphis in May then. He's cooking his own, uh, the the spring fling for the Great Lakes Barbecue Association this this weekend. That's tomorrow. Oh, so wow. it's a four-meat contest, and he cooks under another team name, you know, just for, like, rib burns. Yeah. But he's going into that. He won it two years ago. Yeah, I mean, y'all are both doing real well up in Michigan using our stuff, and I, I can't thank you enough, and a great ambassador. Well, you know, talking about competition barbecue, kind of what, you know, I love talking about sometimes, what categories would you consider your best? I would say brisket now that you've kind of told me. You Bris- know. Yeah, brisket we've had the most, um, most first places, and uh, ribs is the second you know, runner-up. Chicken we do pretty good. And like most people, pork is way down here. But we're working on that. So we just did a practice two weeks ago, and we got, like, the most flavor out of our pork that we've ever had. Well, outside of barbecue. Fingers crossed. Outside of barbecue. I know we're kind of jumping around here. i got to ask, what what you didn't tell us, what do you do for a living outside of barbecue? I have a lawn and landscape company. I've had for, this is my 33rd season 33 years and snow plowing in the winter you know so now I snow think. plowing just sounds interesting and for somebody like me that we don't get all that kind of stuff here right i mean when uh gosh if it if a snowflake falls here people uh, everything closes and i mean it's like the world's ending yeah here. if they call Seriously. it forward on forecast all the schools close start before snow even starts these days yeah, some of my Bad. customers, if we're not there within two hours, they're doing the same thing. So it's wow. like uh, babysitting for a 
customers. You know, well, what's kind of the wildest story you have about plowing? You've got that's got to be some kind of you've got to have something good. <laughs> I put a new guy in a truck once in my diesel truck, and I had one of my other trucks, and we were doing this big restaurant parking lot. And I told him, I showed him how to do it. He's never plowed before. I showed him how to do it. I said, okay, you know, when you, that's all you got to do with the diesel is just barely gas it across, and at the very end, give it a little gas and push the snow up the bank. So I'm, I'm, mo- or I'm plowing another area, and all of a sudden I didn't see Steve backing up. So I back down into that area. He's 10 feet up into the snowbank. He floored it from the beginning of the parking lot and just held it across and kept going. And he climbed the bank and, and beached my truck in the snowbank. That was eight feet high. So did you have to pull it down? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I had to hook it up and can't get off of there. So what what kind of degree are we talking about here in incline? Oh, he made it up to the top. He was almost flat. The back wheels were still down, but he made the front wheels and the plow up the bank. Yeah. Wow. Did he continue to have a job? No. <laughs> well, he did with the lawn, but not snow. He was a shoveler, and I had an extra truck, and we got a lot of snow that day, and I'm like, well, wouldn't hurt. We just put him in the truck. So you have terms for like shovelers. Yeah, yeah. What, do you, what do you mean by that? Like somebody gets out and shovels the sidewalks, sidewalks, uh, in front of the garage doors and residential houses. You know, the sidewalks up to the up to the front doors. Full service, you know, like a concierge service. Oh, I didn't realize you'd done all that. Yeah, you know, there's only one way to do it. Do it right. That's what I said about barbecue. Do a job, big or small. Do it right, or not at all. That's what I say. Is that your motto? Yeah. Is it your <laughs> motto? Did I steal it? No, no. That's a that's a great motto. Well, you know, I always like to hear stories. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm a big story guy. So if you've got that about snow plows, tell me what's your wildest story in competition barbecue. I ask everybody else. I know you've got to have seen some crazy nonsense. Either you know something's happened at a contest, or maybe it's something on the way to a contest, or. Or oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, we were on our way. And this is PG. Yeah. Oh, it's PG. Okay. We were on our way to uh, uh, the Hoosier Barbecue in just south of Franklin, Indiana. Matt and I left. I got a fifth wheel toy hauler, uh, 31 foot. I just put brand new tires on this, tires and rims. We start heading up I-75 at 4 4.05 in the morning, we get 20 minutes up, and all of a sudden I'm looking out my window, and there's sparks, like I'm watching, uh, what's the Tom Cruise movie? The race movie. Oh. When uh, he crashes at nighttime, you know, there's sparks mm-hmm. everywhere. I lost both rims and tires. My oh. trailer, the driver's side, dropped right down to the hubs, to the axles. And I'm just like, Oh my God, Matt! I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and that's all I see is a tire coming faster than us as we're pulling over. It's still doing 70 miles an hour, and it's probably still rolling today. <laughs> we never <laughs> found it. It was four th- four twenty five in the morning. There was no. That's scary. Yeah, we sat there for six hours because no wrecker will come on I seventy five to work until it's light time. So seven eight o'clock a.m. is the first time they come out. Really? Yep. <clears throat> wow. I bet that was a kind of a scary experience then. So we sat up on the bank because that's scary sitting on the side of I 75. You know, one truck or one car just looking down for a minute can just blast right through you. Well, we sat up on the banks, got some lawn chairs because we had them in the trailer. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jay Craig called. He says, hey, I heard what happened. If there's anything I can help you with, if you need a pit brought to writ to Franklin, you know, it's by his place. He says, we'll, we'll do whatever we got to do. So I started throwing around that idea. He said, you know, you're by, you're by the, the Indianapolis down there, you know, and they, they rent trailers. 
we can get a trailer rented. So I started thinking, well, Matt was so mad. He was like, I just want to go home. <clears throat> so I made the decision, we're going. So I ordered a trailer, had it set up right at the comp. They brought it out, plugged it in, air conditioning, everything on and out. I had a small trailer, took my outlaw off of that trailer, put it on the small trailer, put everything in the back of the truck, and we drove to Richmond. We made it for the comp. And you left the trailer sitting on the side of the road? Yeah, I called a company, and they had to come out, and they fixed it on the side of the road enough to pull it to the dealer, and they got it to the dealer, and the insurance took care of everything. And you're still cooking out of that trailer today? Yep. Now I've got to ask, who makes that trailer? Um, it's a KZ Sportster, but the, the key is check your lug nuts. Well, you need to check your lug nuts and your <laughs> tires and your bearings for every long road trip. I do mine every year. I'm a believer. I uh, do my bearings and the whole plates. If every we're going to be traveling much, we do the same thing. I mean, you just can't, I don't like being broke down on the side of the road. I'm, you know, we carry spares and impact guns with us and. We look like NASCAR if a flat happens, which is not knock on wood very often. But, uh, you know, I don't like pulling. Uh, There's probably a running joke about me and pulling trailers. Everybody knows that I don't play around. When we go, we go. Oh, yeah, you're doing 85. I mean, we're running 80, 85. There, there used to be times when Candace would be in a car and she would slow down and me and another guy would be pulling double trailers and we'd run clean out of sight of her. I mean. Uh, I'd rather be driving myself sometimes than. Shaking along the way. Well, not shaking. You're talking about the wind and those long trailers. I'm swaying. That's why women live longer than men. You're right. <laughs> I think it's the adrenaline rush, too. You know what I mean? I mean, I, maybe I should have been a race car driver, hell. I've thought I, of that. Well, you know, I had a problem. But I, I've always kind of drove with a little speed behind me, and I feel like maybe I should have been a where I was from. You know, they used to run whiskey all the time and cars and all that, like old moonshiners. Well, I used to get in trouble, and this is not a joke. My dad was still living, he could tell you. My mom, we call her up right now. I had a, I was a dirt road racer, is what I called myself. And we had a group of friends that we raced the <laughs> dirt roads. And, you know, you can slide in dirt roads, and you can't do that on the pavement, right? Mm -hmm. And so we all had little trucks, and I had a Toyota, you know, I had an S10 one time, a little Chevrolet. And, and we run these dirt roads. By the time you clutch it, and you're in third gear and fourth gear going around these banks, you know, you can't flip them on the dirt roads, but – we used to get the law called on us all the time by almost running people in ditches and all that. So that's totally different times back then. Oh, totally well, different. Wait, wait, wait. You're still a youngster, so compared to me. I'm not that big of a youngster. I mean, I'm I'm 44 now. And I feel like I'm 60. I got 11 years on you. Well, I mean. I think I was in junior high by the time you were born. Man, probably, but <laughs> I was pooping big turds when I was small, no, though. Gosh. I mean, that's the thing about it. Well, it sounds to me Shooting like the queue. <laughs> you have a hard time getting places. Because, so oh. speaking of like adventures, so <clears throat> let's say, let's tell everybody you're here because you came to help us out this weekend. Um, South Haven Spring Fest yes. came and you're coming to Memphis in May, yes. coming to help. So you, you kind of came this weekend for a practice run. Right. And you did not have an easy time getting here. No. So what all happened? Let's hear this. <laughs> all right. Well, my first flight was taken off at 7 a.m. from Flint, Michigan. We loaded everything. We got taxiing out on time. And there was a storm in Chicago, so FAA shut down the airport. So we sat on the runway for an hour and a half, 8.30, 8.25, 8.27, something like that. We started moving. I had a connector flight in Chicago at 8.06, which they're an hour behind me, so so 9.06. I mean, you know, when we took off, we only had a half hour before my flight took off, and, you know, they closed boarding at 15 minutes before the mm -hmm. takeoff. So when we finally got there, I missed my connector. Well, it was a rat race trying to – they're trying to find me a, a – a flight they couldn't find them at the desk so i had to go to one of the courtesy phones and and that lady helped me she found me a flight so i was flying from chicago to 
Dallas Fort Worth and then get a connector. I had like an hour and a half, two hour layover, and then flying from there to Memphis. The flight from from Dallas Fort Worth was supposed to leave at four fifty six. Then it got delayed to five twenty. Then it got delayed to five forty six. And once it got delayed the second time, we found out that they had no crew. So they were waiting for a crew to come in. They didn't even have any crew to help board people. So then then they delayed it a third time because they didn't the captain wasn't there. They finally got a captain and they came over the, the PA and said, We got a captain but he's in the air on a flight right now. When he lands, he's going to come here and fly this one. So everybody's all happy, finally. Then they delayed it to 647. Then it went to 707. Then they said it's raining and they can't load the luggage because the ground crew won't work loading the luggage. And then they canceled it. Gosh. So... And what time was that when you finally got the last call that they canceled? Eight, eight oh seven, something like that was the last time that the flight was supposed to take off. Eight oh seven or eight twenty, I think it even went to eight twenty. So we went from four fifty six to eight twenty delays. Finally, they canceled it. So if you ever been in an airport when you got a canceled flight, everybody's everybody's running for the next line. Luckily, Megan, my girlfriend, got right on the computer, and she started working on the computer and looking for flights, and we couldn't find any flights. Rental cars, everything was, because there were so many people, only two places out of all the rental places would do one way. You know, because you got, I, we, I mean, there were 60, 70 people in, in line at Dollar and Avis. So we couldn't get a car, or I couldn't get a car. There wasn't any available. They, they didn't have any. They were having a bunch shipped over, but it was going to be three hours at least, and it's already 9 o'clock. So Megan looked at every airport around, everywhere I could fly in. I could fly to Little Rock, Arkansas, and then take a two-and-a-half-hour bus, or I could take a bus at 11.15 at night, and this is 9 o'clock, 9.15 at night, and either I'm sleeping in the car rental terminal or we're going to get that, that bus. If I was going to get a rental car, that was going to be a seven-hour drive all overnight. I might as well at least get a little bit of sleep. Well, I tried. Couldn't sleep. So uh, finally, that was an eight-hour drive this morning. I got here at seven seven thirty this morning. and It doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. <laughs> I know. So I get an Uber. It takes me to the to the hotel, to the Hilton, and I get there and you or and Candace had had three days reserved for me or paid for. And it's what time did I get there? Eight o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have a they didn't have my my room. I didn't check in by 4 p.m., so they sold it to somebody else. And when we talked to them at 6 a.m., they still had your room. Yeah. But so such a... I don't have anything nice to say, so I'm not going to say anything about that. About the Hilton. Yeah, Hilton Garden Inn and Olive Branch. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it was a rough situation, but we do appreciate you being here. I'm here. Finally made it on the show. I you finally it. made it. I appreciate and it. And you really went through hell or high water to get here because it rained <laughs> all night on that bus ride, did it not? It did. That's awful. All night. And you said the bus driver was swaying all over the road, right? Oh, the last two hours. I put my seatbelt on. I think I was the only one on the bus, but I was the only one that wasn't sleeping. You know? So the bus wasn't full. No, there was probably 12, 14 people. So you had room so. to like space out a little bit at least. Yeah, I had my own two seats and. Now, I've not been on a bus like that in years. Did it have a bathroom and all that? Yep. Okay. That's probably not bad, Dan. But those seats are, don't recline back or anything, right? Like a 
like a plane seat. It goes back probably a little bit. Yeah, Not a little more than the plane. It's probably three, four inches at the most, but nothing. But you still got all the hardware from the seat in front of you, and your legs can't go anywhere, and you might have knee room, but you can't stretch out. And there was only two rules on the bus. Nothing in the aisle, feet, anything. He says, if I look if I look in the mirror or, or the cameras and I see anything now, you're off the bus. And cell phones, you had to have them turned off or use your, your mic, you know, your headphones. Because he it was, was overnight. A, he was a pretty strict bus driver then, huh? So you couldn't even stretch out your legs across the seats. As long as I kept them out of the aisle, kept them on my two seats. <laughs> But I'm 6'4", so obviously that didn't work too well. So yeah, that didn't work out. So you haven't slept since? No, that, that was the plan. I was going to go to the hotel. Yeah. Keith called yeah, when I was uh-huh. on the bus. He said, uh, just go ahead and go back to the hotel, you know, get a few hours sleep, and I'll see you for, for lunch, and then we'll do this. Well, they didn't have a room for me, so. So we brought you over to the house, showered you up, you well, know. I took a shower. Well, yeah, <laughs> you took a shower. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Yeah. You took a shower. And I appreciate the hospitality. That was, oh, yeah, man. That yeah. right there. I mean, once I once I got to the hotel and, and there was no room, I wasn't tired. I was wide awake. I was, I had a, I got a coffee and I was like, let's, let me just get a shower and. It's just like shoveling we'll, snow, right? We'll go. You're just going right through it. Because you probably had some long days shoveling snow, right? Oh, yeah. And plowing. Yeah. I used to have. Now I do about 12 to 14 hours from start to finish for all my jobs. But I used to have two trucks doing 32 hours. That was long. I bet. I had probably 180 residential houses. I had 11 subdivisions I did all the roads on. I don't want to do that ever again. Yeah, that would have probably been a lot. Well, look, let's jump back into some food and talk about some food. (laughs) So what do you... When you're at home and you're not cooking comps and all that, what's your what's your go to? What's Kevin cook? What does he like to eat? Um, well, steak for sure. I mean, I like last two three years have been on sort of a relaxed keto type thing. You know, um, just the good vegetables, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the um, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and Anything you want, steak, pork, chicken, just eat that. You know, and I lost 30 pounds. I was up to 40 pounds down, but I'm at 30 right now. But that's what I like to eat. Leftovers, I like making pizzas. I don't know oh, if you've yeah. ever seen some of those. I got a steak pizza that I make. That's I've seen those pictures online. Phenomenal. Well, you do. You Well, you cook a lot at home. And I know that every morning you have a ritual, don't you? Oh, yeah, the hot tub. You get up and you get, what time do you get up and get in the hot tub every morning? Anywhere, whenever I wake up, 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock usually, and I go right out, I get the the coffee made. I get my, my Heath Riles 30-ounce uh, coffee mug set up, and, and I go out the hot tub. Sometimes an hour, sometimes two hours, depending if I have to go to work or if it's just wintertime, I'm out there easily two hours. Do you just soak up in the hot tub for a couple of hours, yeah. drink your coffee, watch the news? I assume you got TV out there or something? Nope, I got my phone. You got your phone? You just play on the phone? I scroll on Facebook. I play poker. So I wrinkle up and get tired. <laughs> I'll be. I can't do nighttime. Nighttime, the hot tub wakes me up. Really? Yeah. If I, if I do it just before, if I go in there before bed, I'll be like, Antsy. See, I've always heard hot tubs relax you and all that and, like, put you to sleep. Not me. Not you. Wide awake. I like it. So, well, you know, and I guess that was going to lead into more questions. I wondered if you got in in the evening times and relaxed and kind of chilled and had a beer and, you know, done some cooking and things like that. But you don't. It's kind of a morning time ritual. I recently I have been because I've had, like, a, you know, rib pops out and, you know, Got a little sore back a little bit. And when going back to work, like, last couple of weeks, you know, I'll get home from work and it'll be all chilled because it's been pretty cold up there, too. And maybe jump in for a half hour, but that's about it. Yeah. Mostly morning. That's a ritual. 
Well, you know, you get a hot tub. Well, let me ask this: what, What's the best barbecue joints in Michigan? Because I've got to say that I've not had the opportunity to to have a lot of barbecue in Michigan. We had. Did we have any? I don't think we did the whole time we were there. Uh, any barbecue joints? Well, you, so you went the time you're saying, but then there was one time where we went up together, and that's the first time that I met Kevin. But I don't think that we had barbecue that time. Not mm-hmm. from a restaurant, anyways. We ate barbecue at the, what we went for. There's there's nothing outstanding. I mean, you got some food trailers out there. Um, Steve Coddington, you know, Bubba's Barbecue. Steve's a great guy. Yeah. Well, that's how I learned. You know, I took my very first class or the very first comp I ever cooked. I had a, a char griller. We had two char grillers, me and my buddy, Jesse. And we said, let's go cook this Auburn Hills contest. It was a, a KCBS, a pro KCBS. We pull in there, you know, we pay the thing we get everything i only knew how to cook in my backyard i had no idea that you there was a flavor profile for judges and all that so we get all set up and they got us on the grass away from the 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 main part you know all the big guys right across from us is mark rasmussen smoking aces with a smoker out of the back the, the trailer looked like a NASCAR hauler. And we're like, this is what we're competing against. What the hell are we doing? And I think he ended up winning that that year. It was 2013. And we took, we finished dead ass last. But we weren't last in every category. So we finished. And as soon as I did that, that was the same year that Steve Coddington won the Barbecue person of the year. He beat me out. Through Kingsford and Stephen Reichland. And the owner of the restaurant that he was at at that time said, I want you to have a barbecue team and you know, pick a team and, and travel. You know, he'll pay for it. So Steve picked me because I don't know why he picked me, but I finished all the ca- categories. You know, I, I, I was a successful turn in at, at my first comp. So which was a great thing because I learned a lot. I mean, that's where I met you. We went down to Murfreesboro with them and uh, him and Phil Wingo and Chris Mills. Um, oh, Chris Mills. Yeah. Flying pigs. Flying pigs. Yeah. It is. You know Chris Mills, right? So we would go down there and cook the KCBS, KCBS part and he cooked the MBN. Yeah. So. Well, you were around a great group, great group of guys there and, uh, you know, Steve, Bubba, mm-hmm. as we all know him. Um, what year was that? 20, 2016, 2015? What, the barbecue, he person, barbecue of the person of the year? 2014, 13? I think he got it in 14. 14. It might have been for 13, but he got it in 14 because that was the year we did the 2014 and 2015 with Lockhart's Barbecue. Yeah. And then I started the Kevlar Barbecue in 16, and I think I only did two comps. I didn't even join KCPS at that point. I didn't join KCPS until 2017. And then, as they say, you know, it's all history now. All history. That's kind of like me. I mean, we started out cooking a little local contest like everybody does, I think, in their backyard at home. And and it just started out as just cooking for a group of friends. And it turned into, well, you should cook that contest. And then now – I don't know. I still, it's kind of crazy. Sometimes we talk to all these barbecue people all over the country and have friends, barbecue friends all over and everything else. It's really, uh, really cool. Really nice. That's when they say barbecue family, it's, it's true. I, I truly believe that. I mean, some of my best, best closest friends, including you come out of barbecue. I mean, it's uh, I know we don't get to see each other all the time. A few times a year that we do, it's we a good thing. get together and celebrate and have a good time. And, uh, you know, just uh, always eat good food and cook. And uh, I don't know, barbecue is. It's it's very different than a lot of other things you can get yourself into. And I'm looking forward to learning something new this weekend, too. Now, you, you organize like a rib contest, yeah. correct? Yep. Every year you yep. do? In January, up in Michigan. Yeah. It's uh, You try to get me to come cook it every year. I need to come cook. I mean, it's $100 to buy in. And I make it, you know, we usually get about 25 people or at least 25 people. And 
that makes first place thousand dollars for a rib comp. I mean, that's pretty darn good. Yeah. You know, to come cook three, four or five hours, something like that. But this year was nice. You know, we had good weather. It was thirty some degrees. But last year it was negative twelve <laughs> at seven a.m. when everybody started showing up to to load in. It hit, fun. it hit 15 degrees. Um, that was the high. Are you going to do like a, you know, a summer one? <laughs> <laughs> you have any plans for a summer one? Yeah, Michigan's real nice in the summer. That's when we came. Well, we put three, we put three easy ups together and we got four teams in, in one big tent and we have two big heaters or two propane heaters in there. And it's actually almost 80 degrees. You know, if yeah. you stand on a cooler and, and have your thermo pen open, it's almost 80 degrees in there. So we're down to T-shirts when we're cooking inside. You just take tent walls and then close. Yeah, close it all up. and gotcha. That makes sense. So how many of those uh, rib burns have y'all done? I've done three at my house. I've held three at my house, plus I've held our uh, – Great Lakes Barbecue Association, uh, Beak to Beak. And that's a special thing, thing they do. It doesn't cost any team, but as long as you take a first through third in any Michigan competition or any uh, qualified competition for GLBBQA, which is Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. So if you get a first through third, you're in the Beak to Beak. And they go... We have a competition for a belt, and it's pretty neat. Jim Miller's won it the last three years from uh, Firehouse Smoke. He's a, he's a good chicken cook. I don't guess I know him. He's our president of the GLB, GLBBQA. He's from uh, Sault Ste. Marie. They run that comp um, up in the Sault Ste. Marie, but it's, they can't do it anymore. We've dropped down to one comp. So talking about comps, what's your favorite comp you cook on the circuit? <clears throat> um, probably Westlands, All-American Barbecue. That's where we're – I mean, it's got a special place for us. That's where we won our first GC. Um, our, probably our most favorite that we ever had was Mark and Rich's from the Barbecue Superstore. They're um, – Rumble on the river. They would have 28 teams. So that way you have seven, you have four tables of seven, and you you hit every different table on every meet. You'll never hit another table. So he, was, he won't take any more than 28 teams, or they won't. And we won that. They had five years of that, and we won it the last two years. Yeah, we always send in product because they yep. kind of ask vendors to um, – you know, donate something or a little swag or something like that, and they make great goodie bags for all the teams. That's oh. a great great way to give back to all the teams, you know, coming in, I think. The box is probably a foot and a half, you know, rectangle. Fill two of them for every team. So wow. it was the, the, best, the best gift box in, in barbecue, we would say. Well, you know, what would you say is the biggest um, misconception about competition barbecue being, you know, because when I'm going to be honest, when I think of Michigan, that just don't make me scream barbecue. So, I mean, I understand you all have a lot of contests and barbecues everywhere now, but what, what, when you think of barbecue, what do you think of? I mean, you know, talking about regional barbecue sections, I guess is where I'm leading that into, like Memphis, Kansas City, North Carolina, you know, places like that. I know California is kind of unique with some things. Um, but what is unique about Michigan-style barbecue or, or northern-style barbecue, I guess, compared to what we southerners know as barbecue? I would say it's a little sweeter. Sweeter? Yeah. Like like in ribs, we do a rib – you know, I, I I like to say rib candy. And that's that's what we've found, you know, works up that way. Sweeter the better. Yep. Not not too sweet. I mean, don't go crazy. You know, the brisket obviously isn't going to be sweet. Some people do, you know. Everybody sauces them differently. I don't like to put sauce on the slices. You know, 
I just do the top. That's me. And then slice it. So when you take a bite of that brisket, you're tasting the meat, and you got that little bit of, little hint of sauce. And that sauce actually sets for 10 minutes on the smoker, on the outlaw. That kind of creates a nice crisp bark anyway. Not crisp, but tackier tackier type. And it it holds up to be able to slice it. Yeah. Because I sauce it first and then slice it, and it sort of messes it up. But I don't once, know how that is. Once you lay those, you know, once you lay those slices out, they're they're not together anymore, so you don't see the. That's right. And then you paste back over it. I'm sure a little as you anyway, don't you? Just a, yeah, the faces, the slices on the faces. Yep. You know, you got to make them sheen, shine, and glisten, and so words you can put into that. Well, you know, talking about shining and glistening, I see a lot of these guys now using duck fat spray kind of misting it on the really? meat before they shut the box. Yes, I haven't told you that. I've seen that a lot lately of, of people I've never doing heard that. Have you hadn't heard it? Nope. I've seen some people online and caught it in a few videos and things, wondering why it was sitting on the counter in a comp trailer. And I've seen like some, some group videos of things and stuff of people misting their products. It's kind of, <coughs> I don't know, I like duck fat spray, don't get me wrong, but I never thought about using it as kind of a, a sheen on there. I haven't had any luck with the duck fat spray. Every time I go to spray it, it comes out in like solid streams. I can't get it to to spray. Well, it probably won't run in negative 12. <laughs> the temperature you're in. <laughs> okay, it, it gets 80 to 90, you yeah. know, in the summertime. It was warm so, when we went there. It was. It was warm when we went there. It was warm. Well, you know, I guess... Man, I, I guess with you it's a little bit different than any other podcast guest because we just have so much to catch up on. We see each other. It's probably been more like general conversation here than yeah. than a lot of the other podcasts we've been on. But, you know, I appreciate you being a good friend, man, and uh, always having my back and support. Is there anything uh, you'd like to say, you know, uh, before we jump off and anything like that? Oh, you know, I always like to ask this crazy question, I guess, before you wrap that up. Sometimes somebody's guess. Is there anything you carry in your pocket every day? It's just useless. Nope. Everything you use is in your pocket. Everything I use is right here. Nothing weird. Nope. All right. I like to ask. <laughs> We've had some people carry weird things in their pockets. So, well, tell the people where they can find you at. Or you got anything left to say? Would you? You know. No, I look forward to this weekend. Well, I'm, I'm a little sad that I missed the setup. You know, I wanted to be here for the whole, the whole shebang. You know, and but we'll give you that full opportunity at Memphis in May since you're <laughs> driving down for it. Oh yeah, we'll tell you when to be here and we'll roll that way. All right, we'll be early. I'll let you set up as much as you want to set up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you say gonna, that. Sounds like you're going to use me. No, I would not do that, man. Uh, we try to keep our setups minimal and everything else, but, you know, I don't know if we – I know we talked about it a while ago. You was in town for South Amon Spring Fest, but Kevin's kind of, you know, coming in and helping me at Memphis here. I can't run two pits at once and keep up with everything, so Kevin's going to be one of the guys that helps run one of my pits, um, you know, and uh, I don't want to trust anybody with that job. He's a hell of a cook himself. And uh, keeping the con- temperature consistent when we throw those ribs on there to cook, we're going to see what we can't turn out. So let's uh, let's go down here at South Haven and see what we can do this weekend, brother. Oh, you're putting some pressure on me. Thanks. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. You might want to sleep a few hours. You might want to get a few few uh, hours of sleep tonight. We're not going – I'm not going to keep knocking back these cold ones with you today. I will be out. Out like a light. This evening. Yes. Well, look, I appreciate you. Where can everybody find you at if they want to connect with you, Kevin? Uh, pretty much just Facebook. I got a Kevlar barbecue page and – that's pretty much it. Pretty much it. I mean, I just do competitions, you know. Everybody's like. Just hey. do. That's hard work. Well, yeah. A lot of people that have been in the competition, you know, they're like, well, I like to cater because it's guaranteed money. Well, I have a job. So, you know, this is just passion. and Just a great hobby to get into. It's, a, it's an expensive great hobby to get into. Yes. <laughs> well, look, we appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. And uh, hope maybe when you get back in town from Memphis, we'll get you on again and uh, we'll recap some other stuff. All right? Maybe you won't have a long story to tell about how you had to get here, the journey. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. No, we'll be driving. 
That's right. We're going to take the Maserati down here. And last time we came down, it was 2,600 miles in four days. It's like a cannonball run, baby, ain't it? That's right. Me and Megan got in there and just. Y'all like to explore everything around, though. It's spontaneous. Don't blame you. Spontaneous yeah. and, you know. Last time y'all flew off to New Orleans from here. Yep, we went down to New right Orleans, back. came back. We, well, we took a couple of days going down. We went yeah. to Heavy Smoke over in St. Louis, and I think that's where it's from. Mm -hmm. And then we met you guys in Memphis, Memphis Barbecue Company. And then you went and had down beignets down, and coffee, right? Down to the shed. And then we went to New Orleans. I'd never been to New Orleans, so that was, it was a good trip. New Orleans is a great food city. It is. Maybe we need to meet up down there. Let's go. Let's go. All right. All right. Appreciate you for coming on, brother. Cheers. Cheers. And Cheers. I appreciate everybody for tuning in, and we'll see y'all next week. Another episode of Shooting the Cute. Be sure to like and subscribe to this if you want to hear every week's episode. We'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Shooting the Cute podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, please feel free to reach out to us on our social media channels or through our website. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. Leave us a review if you enjoyed the show. Until next time, keep shooting the cue.